Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, ladies and jelly beans. The end of week six. We are halfway through the first term. How scary is that? Another six weeks, and we are done. Well, for this term. And then you have just another term. 12 weeks, and then is exam season. How cool is that, hey? Are you excited? No. Why not? It's good, yeah. Exam is good. Because, think about it. What happens in an exam? Or before you go in an exam, think about the physiology. You get a little bit nervous, right? Your adrenal glands secrete adrenaline. It will activate you. It will make you alert you might encounter a little bit of what is generally known as the fight and flight, i.e. your blood pressure will go up slightly, not dramatically, your heart rate will increase, <coughs> your breathing will get faster, your palms are getting a little bit more, you know, clammy. These are all Symptoms of when you go into an exam. And there are also the same symptoms when you are excited about something. When you play, for example, a computer game and you get the adrenaline kick. It's exactly the same thing playing a computer game or doing an exam. There's no difference. Some people argue that it is even the same thing going into an exam than sort of, I don't know whether I should say that here, but sort of preparing for sex. Right? It's exactly the same. Physiologically, it is the same thing. So I don't want to put you off having sex, right? 
I don't want you to associate that with exams. It's not a test. But if you think about it, what your body goes through, just going into an exam, is nothing but excitement. And you can actually use that to your advantage. I know that you've got some assignments next week. Right? Is that right? Now, in order to prepare for these assignments or in class tests, there are a few things where you can sort of play a trick with your brain. Your brain has learned in the past that assignments are probably absolutely horrible. They are terrifying. Anxiety levels will go woo, exponential growth. We will discuss that to the end, uh, week 12 or something like that. Exponential growth, anxiety goes through the roof. And yet, it is exactly the same emotion that, that you have when you play something like a computer game. Nothing else. So when you go in the exam, what you can do is you can change your mindset and you can say, I am excited. I am excited. Go in the exam and say, I am excited. What you will notice instantly is that your anxiety goes away and is replaced with excitement. Why? Because it's very easy. You feel already the same thing. You have already the same emotions present. So all you need to do is just a little bit of reframing. Instead of, OMG, I'm going to F that up, you say, I am excited. You can say it loud even, if you like. It will, I guarantee you, it will make a dramatic difference. Try it out. Speaking of assignments and things like that, there have been, uh, on the group chat, there have been some speculations about the BI-308 uh, assignment and tests and things like that. So let me just quickly give you a rundown of what assessments we will do together in this module. I don't know about any other modules, but for this module, what we will do in chronological order. In week eight, that's the week after next, in week eight, we have an assessed practical. So the assessment is Monday, and Tuesday, it depends on your practical class when you have been assigned to it. And in today's session, I will go through the pre-lab for that. That is the assessment for your skills. And what I'm looking at, and I will pick that up later when I talk about the, the pre-lab for week eight, is can you actually use a pipette and a spectrophotometer? Yeah? Are your measurements precise? Can you follow a protocol? And can you do some basic statistical calculations? And again, we will do that. There is no lengthy write-up for you. The practical or the results for this practical will be submitted by the end of the practical. So you don't have to go away and write things up. I am not interested in you know, assessing your skills in expressing yourself and making up some results. Um, I want just simply to see how accurate you are. You, you can work, how precise, I should say. Right? So this assessment, you don't have to stress about it. You can't really prepare. And it is also open book. 
That means you can bring into the practical class any resource that you feel you require. Please don't bring in emotional support, snakes, uh, dogs, cats, squirrels, or anything else. We can't have that in the lab. But you can bring in, you should bring in a calculator, things like that. <laughs> if you want to bring in notes from previous practicals, absolutely fine with me. I don't have any problems with that. OK? So that is the assessed practical. And I will go through that later on in the second part of this session. Week 8. Week 12. That is the last week before we break up for Christmas. There is an in-class test. This in-class test is a multiple choice, uh, is not, sorry, is not a multiple choice test. Because I think multiple choice very often is multiple guess. And by default, if you have got five options, you will get 20% by default. Just if you always cross A or C, yeah, you will always, you should always get 20%. I had students in the past who got 10%, which means they really did beat the statistics. Yeah? They were dumber than the statistic predicted. <laughs> Or they just simply overthought things, right? Both, both options are possible. Anyway, the test in week 12 is an in-class test. It is a problem-solving test. What are the problems that I'm going to give you? These are calculations that you can practice when you go to this Practice Makes Perfect website where I've sent you the link. The questions will not be totally different. You will be asked, for example, make up a solution with do -do 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 -do, calculate the pH, do -do 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 -do, something like that. Yeah? Now, the fantastic news is it is a one-hour test. Well, actually, it will be around 40 minutes. <coughs> and again, it is an open book test. So that means you can bring resources. You can bring in your notes. You can't bring in your big brother. You can't phone a friend. Sorry? Um, in principle, you can use your phone, but you will not be allowed to have internet connection. Yeah? And please do not, do you, do not use any voice assistance. I make these announcements in every, pra in, in every exam, and you can bet every single exam there is a student where you know that they, you know, do things. So in the last year's test, I said, please do not use any uh, assistance or something like that, because it's not fair. And then, a minute later, you could hear Siri's dulce voice saying, sorry, I didn't get this question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not good. So that is assessment number two. right? Now, if you do the practice question, and I've sent you the link to that, but I will send it again. If you do these questions, if you feel comfortable with them, I can almost guarantee you that you will get a fantastic mark. OK? Last assessment, last coursework assessment will be online quizzes. 
I have not yet decided totally how I'm going to play them. So um, don't worry about it. Uh, I, I have said that I will probably uh, make them live on Christmas Day. <laughs> so that you don't get too bored. The good thing about these online quizzes is that the deadline for submission of all these quizzes, and I don't know whether I do them through Moodle or through Google. <coughs> I need to see what works better. The deadline for these online quizzes is Star Wars Day. <laughs> May the 4th. Be with you. Yeah? So you have almost, well, four and a half months to complete these online quizzes, right? So these are the coursework assignments. These are the coursework assignments. In this module, coursework and exam count 50-50, right? That means if you score 100% in the coursework, which I have seen people doing, so it's not totally impossible. If you score 100% in the coursework, you don't need to score anything in the exam because the pass rate is 40%. So you do the maths, 100% coursework plus zero in the exam is 100 divided by 2 gives you 50% total module mark. And you need 40% overall, because people ask me, 40% overall to pass a module. Right? The exam, just, just to let you know quickly, the exam is a two-hour exam. It comprises 30 multiple choice questions in section A. And in section B, it is one problem question. OK? In previous years, you had the choice between uh, one out of three. We've decided that this is not such a good idea because we will get students who say, oh, in the final year, I've never done any statistics. Yeah, you have done statistics. Yeah, but I've never been tested on statistics. Well, because you avoided the questions. So it's not my fault, technically. Um, so this year, it is one question, one problem question that you have to do. And for that, you have two hours. Right? Any questions about that? Are you, are you clear about the assessment pattern? The assessed practical actually counts for 20% of the coursework. The in-class test counts for 15, 1, 5, and the online quizzes, and there will be 15 quizzes, will also count for a total of 15%. So we've got 20, 15, 15. That gives you the 50% coursework and then the 50% of the exam. Oh, everything clear? Yeah? Fantastic. So, let's start business. So, on Monday and Tuesday, we are doing the non-assessed pH and buffers practical. In terms of health and safety, yes, you have to wear gloves. Yes, you have to wear specs, safety specs, because you are dealing with some rather unpleasant chemicals. <coughs> and I honestly do not want you guys to experiment with phosphoric acid in your eyes. 
It's not a good thing, trust me. And even if you don't handle this stuff, the person behind you might do, and you don't know what they are up to. So please, please, please make sure that you can see things and feel things in the future as well. I don't want anyone to lose an eye, uh, a finger, a limb, or uh, anything like that. So please, please, please be careful. Respect health and safety for that. Okay? You are using technically, well, reasonably advanced stuff, uh, i.e. pH meters. Treat these pH meters with respect, please. They are roughly, one of these pH electrodes is about 300 quid a pop. If you deliberately destroy them, well, we will claw the money back from you guys. Right? Accidents happen, but if you break them deliberately, not good. So, in your practical manual, you've got some instructions how you should treat them. Never let them run dry. And um, never lay them on the bench and keep it always, keep it always wet. I mean the pH electrode. And keep it in storage. <laughs> You're dreadful. <laughs> You're totally dreadful, right? And you always should keep it in storage solution when it's not used. Um, when you measure the pH, you go into your solution. Often you will have a magnetic uh, stirrer underneath to, to mix the solution. There is a little sort of a magnetic flea um, that will spin and, and mix the solution. These magnetic fleas and pH electrodes don't work very well together because the magnetic flea has the annoying habit of destroying pH electrodes by just spinning and crushing it. So whenever you go in with a pH electrode, turn off the magnetic stirrer. We have also seen cases of helicopter stirrers or helicopter fleas, where a student turned up the, the, the stirrer so much that the flea started to spin like crazy and came out. And went and poked a hole in the ceiling. No, it didn't, but yeah, I just thought. So please, always turn them off. Well, that's basically everything that you need to know about the pH electrode and the magnet. No, the, when, you, when you've done your measurement with the pH electrode, you clean the electrode just by uh, rinsing it with some water and then gently with a tissue drying it. So that avoids any contamination during the operation. Okay? But it's outlined in your, in your manual. So here is what you are actually supposed to do. So in the first instance, you have to make some stock solutions. You then mix these stock solutions uh, to make a buffer of a desired pH. You then do a little bit of calculation with the henderson hasselbalch equation. And we will do this equation uh, just uh, in a minute. Um, you then check out what happens when you dilute a buffer, and we can discuss that as well. 
And last but not least, you will do a titration of uh, some phosphoric acid, and hopefully you will see some interesting effects with that. So here, the first thing is, oops, yeah, you get seasick, sorry about that. Make stock solution of buffer components. Ah, good evening. Make stock solution of buffer components. So, where is it? So here, you are basically asked to make 50 milliliter of 150 millimolar potassium dihydrogen phosphate solution and 50 milliliter of 150 millimolar disodium hydrogen phosphate solution. So here are the two compounds. Which one is the acid? What do you reckon? Is it the potassium? Or is it the sodium? Which one is the acid? Abia says potassium. potassium. You say potassium? Potassium is the acid. Potassium, the, the potassium compound, the potassium dihydrogen phosphate is the acid. Why? It has more protons in it. It has two protons here, whereas the sodium salt only has one proton in it. Yeah? So you basically have, where do I put that? H2PO4. Ah, let's go to a different. So we have H2PO4 minus gives HPO4 2 minus plus proton. So therefore, this here was with the potassium salt, and this one here was with the two sodiums. So this one here is the acid. OK? And the task is make up 50 milliliter Sometimes I'm really worried about my mental health. <laughs> I hear. So are you. You're worried about your mental health or mine? About mine? Oh, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right, you know. It's, uh, they say drugs don't work, but uh, if you take the right ones, then. No, I sometimes hear voices, you know, which is bizarre. So your task is to make up 50 milliliter of 150 millimolar solution of both compounds. So 50 milliliter, oh, I'm in the wrong one. So 50 milliliter of uh, 150 millimolar of this compound here, and the molecular weight is 136.09. It's here abbreviated as MR. 
actually I don't like that. It should read molecular mass. So you can insert here gram per mole. So 50 milliliter, 150 millimolar solution, 136.09 gram per mole. Over to you. Do a little bit of calculation. How much of this sodium dihydrogen phosphate do you need? Get your calculator out. Do it with dimensional di di analysis. Do quickly the calculation. Let's see if you are quicker than me. You're done? What do you get? Yep. Did you get it? 1.02 grams of that potassium salt. OK? And you can do the, sorry? 1.02 grams. Do you get it? Good. Well done. <coughs> Bless you. If, uh, and, and the sodium phosphate, you can calculate yourself as well. And then you just simply measure the pH of these two solutions. <coughs> OK, happy with that? In the next step, take 25 milliliter of the potassium salt. So take 25 milliliter of the potassium salt and add and add the sodium solution and measure how much of the solution you need in order to get a pH of 6.5. Yeah? That is what you do in the practical. OK? Pretty straightforward, not technically too demanding. So here you will then say how much volume of the 150 millimolar uh, sodium solution uh, did you actually add? In part C, you will use the henderson hasselbalch equation to figure out how much you actually should use. And we can try and quickly do that together. So we want to have a pH equals 6.5.
the pk will be given as pka in this case is 7.2. And what we want to know is the ratio of acid to base. You got it? So do you want to try it yourself? You need to know the henderson hasselbalch equation, pH equals pKa minus log of acid <coughs> over base. Or you can do it plus base over acid. It's exactly the same thing, same difference. Did you get that? Yep. yep. No problems? Shows you how smart you are and what a good teacher I am. <laughs> OK, so you get a ratio of 100 to 20. 100 parts acid and 20 parts base. Yeah? Did you get that? When you did the calculation, I hope you did the calculation as practice. Does it make sense? Sorry? I have a question. I yeah? Did, I did the, like, pen like that, and I got that, but I tried to make it a fraction, but it wouldn't come to the whole. Oh, so you got, you got five, basically. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah? Yeah. It is five. Yeah. 5 is the same as 5 over 1. Oh, yeah. Yeah? And all you need to do, if you've got 5 over, over 1, you just simply bring 1 to 100. So this one times 20 and this one times 20, so you get 120. Yeah? If you had done base over acid, you would have got something along the line of 0 0.2. 0 0.2 divided by 1. Again, you bring 1 to 100. So you multiply this by 100. You multiply this by 100. And you get 20 over 100 base per acid. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah? Does it make sense? If we look at the pH, our pH 
of 6.5 is lower than the pKa. This means we need more acid. Remember, if the pH is the same as the pKa, then we need exactly the same acid base. If we need if the pH is lower, we need more acid. If the pH is higher, we need more base. Yeah? So that was very easy again. So it would be a 1 and 5 uh, ratio. Make sense? Brilliant. Fantastic. In the next step that you do, You are supposed to mix them together in this 1 to 5 ratio. And it says here, using your calculated figures, using your calculated figure of 1 and 5, put them together in a 1 and 5. So you could use 5 milliliter of the acid and one milliliter of base. Or you can use 10, two milliliters, and measure the pH. It says here that usually the pH is not 6.5. And the reason for that is just that the hannesson hasselbalch equation is a, just a sort of uh, yeah, a little bit like, mm, yeah, with a little bit of squinting and, uh, you yeah, uh, solutions behave sometimes differently from what we expect them to do. You will probably find that in this particular example where we say they don't behave as we expect, they will do exactly that. They will behave as expected and you should get the pH of 6.5. So if you do get a pH of 6.5, and if you've done all your measurements correctly, don't be disturbed. It's exactly what it should be. So all is good. Anxiety level drop. OK? Now in the next step, you are supposed to dilute your solutions. What does that mean? <coughs> so you take, for example, um, 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 five milliliter of acid. No, actually, what we do. Now, we use five milliliter. Yeah, we use five milliliter of the buffer that you just made. Yeah, and we add forty-five milliliters of water. So now we have the 5 milliliter in a total volume of 50. Total volume is 50. What originally was 5 is now 50 milliliters. So that is a 1 in 10 dilution. We've diluted by factor 10. What will happen to the buffer? The pH will? Won't change. No. Will it change? Yeah. yeah. No. Dr. Ellis would sell this as the moment of wonder. <laughs> right? Will it change or will it not change? Hmm. Will it change? Um, it could do. It could do. Yes. We are sitting on the fence, right? 
Now that is a very dangerous position because it really squeezes your balls <laughs> sitting on the fence. It's never a good thing. Will it change? Will it change? Yes or yes? Yes. Will it change? Yes, will it change? Will it change? Let's have a look. OK, so we have our buffer. write it like that. So that's here the acid. That's the base. And here we have a concentration. We have mole 1, number of moles for the acid, divided by the volume of the buffer. Yeah? We have mole 2 of the base divided by the volume. Now, what happens if we leave the number of moles for both acid and base exactly the same, but we change the volume, we multiply the volume by 10 in both cases? What will happen? Well, Let's just simply say we are dealing with two fractions here. How are two fractions divided by each other? So we want to figure out what this part here is. We can say mole 1 <coughs> volume divided by mole 2. So divided by mole 2. And that is exactly the same as multiplying the vol by mole 1, mole 2. So if you multiply this volume by 10, you automatically have multiplied this by 10 because you dilute the whole thing. You just increase the volume. The volume cancels out and you still have the mole there that you had before. So that was the long-winded way. The short way is to say the amount of the acid and base <coughs> molecules don't change. And therefore, the only thing that changes is the volume. And the volume, in this case, doesn't appear in the equation. That means. that as reluctant as I am to say that, but James is right, <laughs> right? Now, again, you should look at his face, how smug he looks, right? But you are absolutely right, James, well done. The pH will not change in this case. The threshold, the capacity of the buffer, will change. Absolutely. You are right. Well done. Huh? Next time you will get some sweets. Make sense? In the last part of this practical, you take H3PO4 phosphoric acid. Now people say phosphoric acid is actually really, 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 really strong acid. That's what people say. Why do they say that? Oh, look at that. It can produce three protons. 
So you can get 3H plus plus the phosphate, 3 minus. Because it produces 3 protons, it must be terribly strong. Well, actually, it turns out that phosphoric acid isn't such a strong acid. It has a pKa of, for the first step, of around, I um, can't remember, um, 2.15. So the pKa is 2.15. That means it is a reasonably strong acid. It's not terribly strong. I wouldn't classify it as a weak, as a very weak acid, but it's sort of in between. Yeah? We can actually calculate the pH of that, can't we? We have a 50 millimolar solution. What is the pH of that? Sorry? You can't really say at this point because we don't know the other pKa's of the second and third. We can ignore the other pKa's. We can ignore them. Yes. <coughs> because they are a factor of, they are P, a pKa value of 5 apart from it. That means 100,000 factor. That's quite a lot. Mm, pretty much. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> So, how would we calculate that? We know we have a pKa, we have a concentration, so therefore what we can do is we can use the equation for a weak acid, pH is equal to one half of pKa minus log of the acid. So we have one half of 2.15 minus log, and we need the acid in molar, so that would be 50 times 10 to the minus 3, that's the milli, And I can see people are working on the calculator. 1.72. Mm -hmm. So the pH in this case is 1.7. It's not terribly strong. Okay, does that make sense? What you then do with this acid is You keep it in your beaker and you add sodium hydroxide to it. And you neutralize the acid. <coughs> and what happens is that you will find a behavior like that. You will find this here. This is when you have, this point is also called the half equivalence point. This is when you have exactly the same amount and, and you, sorry, you, you plot here the milliliter of sodium hydroxide, and here you measure the pH. So 
So at the half equivalence point, you find that you have the same concentration of the acid and base. What does that actually mean in terms of buffer? Excellent. pH in this case is the pKa. At the half equivalence point, the pH is the pKa. And you have a similar case here and a similar case here. This point here and this point here, they also have a name. They are the, what is called the equivalence points. This means at this equivalent point, all of the acid, available acid, has been neutralized by the sodium hydroxide. And that is where you then see a massive jump because we are going to the next level of ions. So I would expect you to see something like that. Okay? This is actually what people use when they uh, I, um, characterize a new substance. You measure whether the substance uh, is acidic or basic. And then you just simply do a quick titration with sodium hydroxide to figure out whether you have where the pKa value is and also whether you have one, two, three or more uh, pKa values that tells you how many protons this uh, unknown substance, for example, contains. So that's technically uh, a, a procedure that people do in the lab still. Okay, you don't need to produce a write-up for the practical on Monday or Tuesday. It is just simply for you to, to see what's going on. Be careful and enjoy the opportunity to do proper pipetting and uh, uh, get some laboratory skills. We have a short break, five, six minutes. And then I tell you what's going to happen in the assessed practical in week eight, okay? <laughs>